baby on the gym. Welcome back to the CMU for another semester. Uh, this is 15, 445, 645 database systems or intro database systems. Uh, my name is Andy. Uh, pretty, I'm pretty sure everyone is in the right place. Um, so before we begin, I want to spend a little time talking about what this course is, is sort of means to me. Uh, so I had, I'm going to dedicate this course to uh, my mentor, Leon Wrinkles. Um, he passed away uh, earlier in the year. He was listed as one of the original data scientists, right? He has five degrees in MIT. He was sort of doing data science where data, data science was uh, a thing. Um, so he really meant a lot to me. And this is with me and him uh, and my PhD student, Joy Ruraj, earlier in the year when he was at hospice. So, um, you know, just as, as we go throughout the course, he's always going to be in the back of my mind with everything. The other thing I'd like to say also, too, is that uh, I want to thank VoltDB uh, for sponsoring the course, right? They provided uh, funding for course development. Um, so they'll be coming later in the semester to give a uh, sort of guest lecture at the end. And it'll, it'll be a nice wrap up to talk about all the things that we'll discuss during the lecture, and you'll see how it's being applied uh, in, in real world database systems. So we're very appreciative of them. All right, so the clicker does not work. OK, so before we start now get into the details of the course, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I really only care about two things in my life, right? Uh, the first one is my wife. The second one is databases, <laughs> right? I don't care about anything else. I don't talk to my family. Uh, I don't have any children. The dog is probably number three, depending on the day, right? But like, I really don't care anything about anything else. So what that means is that when I start talking about databases, I get very excited and I start talking very quickly, right? So if I go too fast, I need you to raise your hand and tell me to shut up and slow down and, and repeat myself, right? Because if you're confused about something, then somebody else is going to be confused about something. So please tell me to slow down. The other thing I also say too is that. Uh, I will not answer any questions about the course material or the lecture after the class is over, right? So in previous years, what will happen is I'll, I'll give a lecture, and then immediately afterwards, like five people run up to rush the stage and ask me questions about like you know slide 23 during the lecture, right? I refuse to answer any of those questions because if you have any questions about the material, stop me while I'm speaking because if you're confused about something, somebody else is going to be confused about something too, okay? So I will, I'm more than happy to answer questions about the lecture as we go along. I won't answer any questions about the, uh, the material uh, at the end, OK? All right. So today's agenda is going to be split into two parts. We'll start off with talking about the logistics of the course, what the plan is, what you expect of you as the student. Um, and then we'll sort of jump right into the material and start talking about uh, the relational model and relational algebra, OK? And again, the, the, the assessment in the back is meant to be a test of your knowledge and skill with C++. It should really take you two or three minutes. My PG student or my students here have took two or three minutes, right? But they've been writing C++ all year. Um, so we're not going to teach C++ to you. If you're not comfortable with C++, then you either, this might not be the right course for you, or you need to sort of brush up on your C++ skills uh, before we get going on, on the course projects, OK? Now, the most important thing that you guys probably care about is uh, the wait list. Uh, as of this morning, we're back up to 150 people. Uh, the max capacity is currently like 100 or so. I think we're like 102, 103, right? So if you're on the wait list, I'm sorry, we just, we just can't take everyone, OK? So we will, uh, people will drop the course, and we'll pull people off the wait list uh, and enroll them. And the way we're going to do this is that in this, it, we will assign you based on the order that you complete the first homework assignment with a 100% score. Right? And that way, we're not dealing with you know, what program are you in, when you're graduating. Right? If you complete the first homework assignment, which we'll give out on Wednesday, we will, uh, we're, we're ignoring the waitlist order on, the, on S3. The order you complete that is the order that we will meet you in the course. Okay? And we'll keep doing this until we get full. OK? As far as you know, this, this, you know, this is the most fair thing we, we've, we've come up with. If anyone has any better idea, uh, bribing the TAs does not work. We got in trouble last year for that. So please don't do that. Uh, we'll just do it based on homework one. Any questions? Yes? The homework will be on Autolab. It'll be on SQL. 
right? And then we'll release that on, release that on Wednesday. And so you'll get, you'll get, you'll get a score right back uh, and Autolab keep track of the submission history so we know who, you know, who submitted first. His question is, if he's on the wait list, we have access to Autolab. Yes, when we open it up on Wednesday, everyone on wait list, on the wait list, will, also, will have access to Autolab. Any other questions? Okay, there's seats in the front if, if you want to sit down. All right, so this course, uh, 1545, 645, this course is all about the design principles of a uh, database management systems. So specifically, we're going to look at disk-oriented uh, relational database management systems. And we'll cover what that is as we go throughout the uh, semester. But all I'll say is that this is not a course about how to actually build database applications or model database applications. Right? I'll teach you uh, advanced SQL on, on Wednesday this week, but I'm assuming most people already know how to write basic SQL right? or build database applications already. Right? So we're really focusing on how do you actually build the, the underlying software to manage the database. Right? So this is not what you're looking for, right? This is why I'm asking you to take the C++ self exam, right? This is a, a project intensive course. If you care about more about the high level things about, you know, how to model or administrate a database, then the alternative you might want to look at is CMU 95703 in Heinz College. I think it might be just called databases or database information systems, something like that. Okay? Again, this is a computer science course about the design of uh, database management software. Now, there was also another database course in CSD called Database Applications that was sort of a hybrid between the Heinz College course and what this course is, 15, 415, or 615. So some of you, some of you may have signed up for that. Unfortunately, that's been canceled because Professor Christos Falutis is taking another year off to go join his uh, Iggy Pop cover band, right? Um, so this is their album they put out earlier in the year. Uh, so, unfortunately, he's gone, so that's not going to be uh, taught this year as well. So, as far as I know, this is the only CSD course available for databases. So, the, the way to think about how we're going to organize the course material is that pretty much this week is the only week we'll talk about sort of the high-level stuff. Of how do you actually, the, the, the theory behind database systems, the relational model, and how do you write SQL on it. And then, going forward, starting next week, we're going to start at the bottom of the stack and start building up the layers to actually build a database management system. All right, so by the end of this semester, you should be able to know and understand you know, pretty much how any database management system is going to be built. Now, there will be some in-memory stuff we'll talk about in the advanced class in the spring, but this is really like the fundamentals of pretty much every single database system that's out there. Right? So we'll start off with talking about storage, and then on top of that, we'll talk about how to do query execution. And on top of that, we'll talk about how to do uh, transaction management with concurrency control. Um, and then we'll talk about how to do recovery and, and maintaining logs and checkpoints and things like that. And at the end of the, of the semester, we'll spend a, a few weeks talking about distributed databases or cloud databases. And I like to finish up the last week, which I call sort of a system potpourri, where we sort of do a, a brain dump on here's how a bunch of different real world database management systems are actually implemented. Again, the VoltDB guys will come give a talk. And then I like to spend the last class of let you guys pick any database system and I'll spend 10 minutes discussing how it works. Right? And it's, this is useful because now you'll be able to apply the techniques that we talk about during the lecture or the semester and see how they actually can, are used in, in real world systems. So the course policy and the schedule are available on the course website, uh, which I sent out last night on Piazza. Um, again, this is an upper level course. I shouldn't have to go over the academic honesty policy, but that's the link to it at CMU. Right? Just the bottom line is don't be stupid. Right? This is not a group project course. Everything should be done individually, even the, the C++ self-assessment. Uh, and so I, what I prefer is that if you're unsure about something, right, please come ask me whether that's the right thing to do or not. Because I'd rather have you say, hey, look, I'm, I, I've been you know, working with somebody on our project, uh, but we're both writing separate code. Is that OK? I'd rather have you come talk to me first rather than me find out later on that you guys have been copying code from each other and then we have to send you over to Warner Hall to destroy your life, right? So the bottom line is, please don't be stupid, okay? If you're not sure about something, please ask me. All discussions and announcements for the course will be on Piazza. Uh, if you're on the wait list, you should be able to sign up for this, right? I don't think there's any restrictions there. Uh, CMU wants me to use Canvas, right? We used that last year. It was, it was a disaster. So everything will be done on, on Piazza, okay? There is a textbook for this course. 
Uh, database systems constant from, from Avi, uh, Hank, and Shonashan. Um, the, this is a, this is my opinion, this is actually probably the best database systems textbook on the, on the market now. A lot of them that are out there, and I've looked at most of them, are like 10, 15 years old. This one, I think, is maybe six or eight years old by now. Um, the newer version is coming out this year, but the sixth version is, is good enough for what we want. Um, so again, for every single lecture, I'll provide the chapters you can read for uh, supplemental information to go over the material in a bit more detail. Uh, and, but there'll be some material that's actually not covered in, in the textbook. And so for every single lecture, we'll also provide lecture notes that cover the, the, so the main points that were discussed uh, during class. For the grades, uh, the, the distribution will look like this. Right? So if you're a SCS undergrad, uh, this class now counts for the systems elective, right? And the requirement there is it has to have over 40% count for projects, and that's why it's 45% for projects. Um, so there'll be a midterm exam and a final exam. And then later on in a few weeks, I'll discuss uh, the opportunity for, for doing extra credit. Basically, we're writing an encyclopedia about databases. So you pick one database system that you want to learn about, and you just write an article for it. Okay? And then, again, I'll, I'll cover this later in the semester. All right, for the homeworks, will be five during the semester. The first one will be the SQL assignment that we're putting out on Wednesday, and that one will be submitted through AutoLab, and it'll be auto-graded, and you get feedback right away. And then all the rest of the homework assignments will be pencil on paper that you'll submit uh, PDFs or photographs on, uh, on Gradescope. Okay? And again, these should be all be done, done individually. For the projects, uh, the, it's sort of like in the OS class, 440, where you're sort of building out your own uh, core piece of software, and every single project will build on your previous implementation. So by the end of the semester, the goal would be to actually build your own database storage manager um, from scratch. And we'll provide you guys with some scaffolding and sort of fill in the, the key parts. Um, so again, for this, it's, it's going to be all in C++11. Um, so we're not going to teach you how to write C++. You can't come to office hours and say, I don't understand C++. We're not going to teach you how to use GDB. Right? We're not going to teach you other, other tools to do debugging. Again, this is CMU. You should be able to figure this out. Already know it ahead of time. Um, if you're not comfortable with this, then again, this might not be the right course for you. I'll say also, too, is that every project is going to build on the previous one. Right? So the first one is the buffer pool manager. The second one is the indexes. You can't build your index unless you have the buffer pool manager. So it's really important that you meet all these deadlines and you're always keeping up with, with the coursework. And right? if you have problems with that, uh, talk to me as soon as possible, and that way we can figure out what the right thing is. The late policy is that uh, for both homeworks and projects, you're allowed a total of four slip days, right? So the deadline will be always at midnight for a project or homework, and then any, any one minute over that deadline uh, is considered late, up for a 24-hour period, and then you're allowed to be late uh, at least four days throughout the entire semester, right? So it's four in, in for both homeworks and projects, not four for each category. Right? And then when you, when you submit it, please just mark down you know, how, many, how many days you're late, and how many days you th uh, late days you have you think you have left, right? That way you sort of do a self audit to know where, where you're at throughout the semester. And again, this is Carnegie Mellon, right? I shouldn't have to say this, but I have to. Uh, all the homeworks and projects should be done by yourself. They are not group assignments, right? It's not 440 where you have a partner. Everything sh should be done individually, all right? That means you can't copy source code from other people in the class. You can't copy the source code from the internet. Now, some people took our source code from last year. They weren't CMU students. It's on GitHub. I've seen their code. It's crap. You don't want it. Uh, and it actually won't work this year because we're going to switch th some things up because we're going to switch from SQLite to Postgres. Um, so, but again, bottom line is just don't copy from other people. Don't copy from things that you didn't write. Right? And then if, if I, we find it uh, when we run through uh, Autolab, we, uh, you know, if it finds that you copy code, then we have to report you. Okay? All right. The last thing I'll say also, too, is that going beyond the, the material that we're going to talk about today, if, there, if you want to get more involved with uh, of database research here at Carnegie Mellon, or just learn about more databases in general, uh, there's three opportunities to do this. Um, again, I will announce these, this on Piazza. The first is that uh, the, the CMU Database Research Group meets on Mondays at 4.30. Right? This is a sort of casual uh, setting where we have researchers uh, my students and sort of sometimes outside uh, people come talk about this kind of stuff they're doing in, in databases. Um, 
If you want to get involved on the development side of a database system, we're actually building a brand new database system here at Carnegie Mellon from scratch called Peloton. Uh, all my students are, are working on this. So we have our developer meetings on Tuesdays at 12 p.m. in, uh, in, Gates, in Gates Hall or Gates Hillman. Um, if, you, if you want to take the advanced class in the spring, uh, it's, all, it's all based on the system. Again, if you just want to get your hands dirty on a, on a sort of what I'll call a sort of commercial grade database system, although we're not there yet, uh, then you can get involved in this project here. Right? And if you're in some master's programs, you have to do capstones. If you want to eventually do a capstone with me a year from now, it'll be based on the system. So you want to get started as, as soon as possible. What I also say too is that, again, not to toot my own horn, but all the students that come work with me on this project have more jobs to turn down than they know what to deal with. Right? Because all the database companies, my friends at database companies, are, are emailing me asking for more students that come out of, come out of our group. Right? Because they can't hire people fast enough. Now, the current name of the project is Peloton. We're going to have to change the name uh, this semester because there's assholes with the exercise bike on, on TV. Uh, we don't know what we're going to call it yet, but that's the current name now. And also say, too, is we spent the summer actually rewriting a lot of the storage engine from scratch. And now we're going to start bringing in the pieces of the old code into our new repository. So it's a good opportunity to get started early on this and sort of understand all, how all the different pieces work together. And again, I promise you, you will have no problem finding a job if you, uh, if you get involved in database systems. And the last one also to announce is that I am running a seminar series uh, this, this semester that will be on Thursdays, but not every Thursday, uh, in, in the CIC building. Um, and so what I do every fall semester is I have a seminar series on sort of one particular theme or category of databases. So this year we're doing hardware accelerated databases. So the thing of like a database system that instead of running everything on the, G on the CPU, they can run it on the GPU or other exotic hardware. So the first speaker will be uh, next week, um, coming from uh, Connecticut, which is like again a, a GPU-based database. Everything will be on YouTube, but if you want to come get pizza and and sort of meet meet and talk about what these guys are doing, then I encourage you to do that. Okay. Any questions about the course? What's what's expected of you? Yes. Will this slide deck be up there online? His question is, is, will the slide deck be up uploaded online? Which slide deck? These or mine? Yeah. Everything will be on YouTube. Everything will be online. Right? But it's a DIY, DIY, D, DIY operation. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Right? But the, sli the slides will be up. Any other questions? OK, let's jump into it. Databases. My second most favorite thing in my life. Um, can anyone give me a, can, an example of a database? What's that? She says SQLite. No. MongoDB? He says MongoDB. No. Redshift? Redshift. No. Okay. Go for it. What's that? There you go, students of the class, right? So she said SQLite, he said MongoDB, he said Redshift. Those are database management systems. He said the students in the class. That is a database, correct. So a database is an organized collection of interrelated data that is going to model some aspect of the real world. So his example is perfect, right? A database could be the list of students that are enrolled in this class, right? Now you need software to actually manage that, and that's what the database management system is. Right or DBMS, right? So the reason why I think this course is important, um, obviously because I'm biased, but the databases are going to be the sort of core component of almost every single aspect of technology or computer applications uh, that, that exist in the world. I guarantee you that even if you don't go into the computer field, if you go to any field that's related to technology, you will come across databases throughout your life. Right? Every single website you can think of is, that's doing something meaningful is going to be backed by a database. Right? Every single major computer application is going to be you know, backed by a database at the end. Right? And then you need a database management system to actually manage that software and provide you some of nice guarantees that you don't want to have to end up writing yourself. So let's use a simple example uh, of, of, of a database, and then we'll see actually how we could actually maybe manage this ourselves or manage this with software. So let's say that we want to create a database that models a you know, digital music store, something like Spotify, right? 
All right, in our, in our database, we want to keep track of the artists and the albums that they put out, right? So what do we need to store, right? We have information about, about the artists, and then we're going to have information about the albums that those artists end up releasing, all right? So the easiest way, you know, the most trivial way to actually implement something like this is to use what are called flat files. So basically, you have a text file that's using a CSV format, a comma separated values, right? And you have one file for artists, one file for, for albums, and every single line in, in, in the file is gonna be one entry or one, you know, one album or one artist, right? So this is the most primitive sort of database you could actually build, right? And what's gonna happen is in order to actually to operate on it in our application code, we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to write our own code to actually manage these files themselves. So if you wanna do a lookup to try to find a particular entry, we're gonna have to open up the file, loop through it, and, and look at every single line, parse the, parse the commas, find where you know, the, 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 the name of the artist is, and extract the one that we actually want. So let's see what this will look like. All right, so again, say I have, my, I have two files, one for artists, one for albums. So in the, the, the text above the file, it says artist, and then in parentheses, I have the attributes that they're storing. So the artist can have a name, a year, and a country, right? And the album can have the name, the artist, and, and the year, right? Pretty simple. And there's, and there's again, the, the, each attribute on a line is going to be separated by commas. That's how we're going to denote the different fields or different attributes. So let's say I want to write a simple query that gets the year that Ice Cube went solo, right? Ice Cube was in NWA. Right? They were screwing him over for money, so then he broke out and did a solo career. Right? So the way we would do this is that we could just write sort of Python code like this that, again, just iterates over every single line, checks to see whether uh, to, for each line split up the commas to get a, a, a record, and then jump to the first offset in that record array, and then check, which we now know is the name, to check to see whether it matches the thing that we're looking for. And if we find the thing that we want, then we then just print out the the year field after casting it to an integer. Pretty simple, right? What are some problems with this? Yes? We don't know if uh, the artists are arranged chronologically, so you might get a year that he was solo, but not the year that he went solo initially. So he said that we don't know whether the, sort of the lines or the columns. Uh, the like, we don't know that the first thing that appears for Ice Cube is going to be the earliest. He said that we don't know whether the first thing that appears for Ice Cube is going to be the, the year that actually that he, that he, he went solo, right? right? Again, for, for this, we can assume that Ice Cube will appear once. Okay. Yeah. Yes? It's, it's what? It's right, so you said it's costly, meaning, like, my example here has three lines. Even 10,000 lines is, is not going to be a big deal. Think 10 billion, right? Some, you know, there's databases that big, like the Walmart database. It's every single item that anyone's ever bought at a Walmart, right? It's going to be billions, right? I think so. I think we're all in agreement that this sucks, right? This is a bad idea. Let's go a bit more detail what's going on. So the first problem we're going to face is that uh, how are we going to ensure that we always use the same artist name uh, for each album entry, right? So if I, Ice Cube puts out different albums, I have in my album uh, file, right, I have, I'm repeating Ice Cube over and over again, but let's say Ice Cube changes his name for whatever reason, how do we make sure that we update all the entries for Ice Cube so they're always the same? Next problem is that what happens if uh, someone comes along and puts in uh, you know, changes an album year and puts an, uh, uh, you know, a funky string that, that, that's not a, an actual integer, right? Again, these are just text files. I can open up my favorite editor and muck around them as much as I want, and then now my program that's actually going to parse them, try to figure out what, you know, in, interpret meaning from them, it's going to come across data that it doesn't expect to actually see. So what, what, what should actually happen? And there's no way we can prevent that because, again, they're just text files sitting in the file system. Anybody can, anybody can open up uh, open them up and change them. The next problem is that how are we going to deal with the case where we have albums with multiple artists? Right? If you have a mixtape that gets dropped and there's a bunch of artists that are on there together, how do I actually model that in my flat files? Right? I was assuming that there was only one artist at a time. 
But now you got to do something screwy, like maybe I'll take my artist field and I'll make an internal comma separated list to denote the uh, multiple artists. Right now, that, but that's kind of weird now. And I have to change my application code to actually deal with that. Then we actually have now the, the code to actually open up these files and find the data that, that we want. Right, so the first problem is how do you find a particular record? So she pointed out that in my simple example here of, of three lines, that's not a big deal. Then she said maybe 10,000 lines would be a problem. That's not a big deal either. It's when you actually get into the billions, like really large uh, 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 data sets, then opening up the file every single time you run a query and scanning through every single entry is going to be really slow, right? Just to find one record, right? Maybe we luck out and the first one is the one we're actually looking for. Worst case scenario is the last one, right? Now, to, now I'll say also too is that maybe for our first implementation, uh, our first application we built, we were running like a website that was using these files. But now we want to have like a sort of a separate service or a desktop application to actually use these files. Right now we have to rewrite all the code we had in the first application to open up the files and parse them and get out the data that we want. We have to duplicate that in our, in our second application and so on. Right now we got to make sure that they're always in sync as well. Right? If we change any aspect of the files, we have to make sure we have to change both applications. The last one is that what if we have uh, you know, two separate applications or two processes or two threads both trying to update the same file at the same time? what's going to happen, right? Well, if we just let the operating system manage this for us, then it's going to be the last writer, right? So the first guy could open the file, second guy could open the file, the first guy does the write, the second guy then does a write, it's going to clobber the first guy's write. So we end up losing data. All right, the last problem now we got to deal with is how to make sure that our data is safe, right? It's not cool that your bank loses your money, right? We don't want to lose any data. So how do we actually ensure that? Well, if we have these, you know, our simple Python code to open up these files and parse them, and we start updating things, what happens when the, the machine crashes or the application crashes while we're doing a write, right? Worst case scenario, we just lost whatever the last thing that we wrote, right? The even worse thing would be actually the file gets corrupted and we lose all of our data. So how, we need our application to make sure that, that we don't lose anything. But now let's say that we want to make sure that our, our database is always accessible. Right? If you have a website, you never want it to go down, so it always need to be up. So what you want to do is maybe replicate it across multiple machines so that if one machine goes down, the second one can, can keep on running still, and still service requests. But now if I, if I have two machines updating the same database at the same time, how do I make sure those things are in sync? So the, the answer to this is a database management system. Right? A database management system is, is software that's specifically designed to store and analyze information in a database. Right? And there's different kinds of database, database management systems. There are different systems that do serve different types of application scenarios. But at, at a high level, this is, all, this is what they're going to do. And so the idea, the way to think about this is, instead of writing all that code to open up those files and manage them, for every single time I write a new application on my database, a database managed system will do this for me, right? And that way I can worry about writing all the business logic or the, or the complicated code that I want to have in my application that actually serves the purpose of the business or whatever it is that I'm trying to accomplish, and I leave the database system to manage all the, the durability and guarantees that I would want in, in, for my data. And the reason why I think, I, again, think about why this is so important Think about all the courses that CMU offers, right, or, as, or in the CS department or SCS, right? There's a course just for this, you know, database systems. Actually, there's two courses because I have two of them, right? There's no course that teaches you how to write a, a web browser, right? There's a course that teaches operating systems, right? These are core, important core components you need to have for, uh, you know, in modern applications. So that's why I think this is worth studying. So now it's sort of taken for granted in today's time that we have all these different database options available to us, uh, but it didn't always used to be the case. Right? Again, when I asked you guys to name a database, I heard Redshift, I heard Mongo, I heard uh, SQLite. Right? These, things, these things exist now, and they solve a lot of the problems that we want to have for, for databases. But back in the old days, it certainly wasn't like this at all. So if you go back to like the 1960s, 1970s, when the first database systems sort of came online, um, these things are actually really difficult to use and maintain, right? 
And part of the reason is because there was this tight coupling between the logical layer of the database and the physical layer. So the logical layer would be what I was showing before when I described the, you know, my, my, the, the music store. And the logical layer would be, here's, I have an artist, and it has, artist has these attributes, and I have an album, and album has these attributes. The physical layer would be how that data is actually being represented and stored in bytes on, in memory and on, on, the, on the hard drive. Right? So back then, in the 1960s and 1970s, these first database systems, you would actually define exactly the physical structure of the database in your application code. Right, so the first example of uh, one of the earliest databases was this thing called uh, IMS from IBM, Information Management System. It's actually, they built the, the, this database system uh, as part of the, the, the Apollo moon mission, right, to keep track of all the parts they, were, they, were, they needed to build the rockets for the, the, to go up in the space. So back then, the way IMS would work was you would say, all right, here's my database, and I want to store it as a hash table. Or here's my database, and I, I want to store this as, as, a, as, a, as a tree structure, like a B plus tree. And then based on what you actually defined as the physical data structure for, for your table or your database, that would then expose a certain API to you in your application. So if you got a hash table, you could do point queries, do single key lookups. If you had a, if it had a tree structure, you could do range scans. Right, so the issue was then now if you, if you later on decided, oh, I don't want a hash table, I actually want a tree structure, then you got to not only dump out the database and put it back in as a tree, the need to go back and modify all your application to now use the, the tree structure API instead of the hash table. Right, so essentially, you kind of had to know exactly how the data was going to be used before you actually started building your application, right? which is not, not always the case and not easy to do. So what happened was in, at IBM, uh, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, there was this guy fresh out of grad school uh, named Ted Codd, and this is, this is IBM research in, in New York at Watson. Um, and he basically went around IBM and he saw all these people writing, uh, you know, these programmers rewriting their database applications over and over again because they had to deal with the case of, of you know, the, the physical data structure changed or the logical structure changed and they had to rewrite the application from scratch. Now, back then, again, humans were cheaper than, than machines. It's the opposite now. So, you know, it, it, you just throw more money and hire more programmers, but this is not scalable, right? So he saw this, and he saw that you know, this is a, a clear problem, and this is because there was, again, a tight coupling between the physical layer and the logical layer. So he wrote this seminal paper in a tech report in 19, uh, late 1960s, and then there was actually the, the full paper in CACM in the 1970s, and he proposed what was called the relational model. And the... Relational model basically has four, uh, three key points. The first is that you're going to store your database as these simple data structures called relations. Right? This is sort of at the logical level. You're not just defining trees. You're not defining sort of these weird hierarchies that people were using back then. Right? You just say, here's my, here's my relation. Here's the attributes that it has, and that's the end of it. And I would have all the relations as well. Then you would have now a, uh, you would access your, your, your relations through a high-level language or declarative language. Right? This, is, this is before SQL, but they, it was sort of basically what SQL is, is now. Right? So no longer in, in the IMS case where I would say, all right, I have a tree data structure, and here's the API for me to make calls to it. You wouldn't do that anymore. You just say, here's the query I want to execute. You don't care how the data system actually stores it. It'll figure out how to do this for you. Right? This was actually pretty controversial back then. Right? Back then, people were saying there's no way a, a, a query optimizer and a database system will be able to generate a query plan that's as efficient as what a human can code. Right? This is sort of similar to what people were saying back then about compilers. Right? There's no way a, compiler can, a C compiler could generate machine code that's as efficient as assembly written by a human. Right? And for some cases, sure, that, 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 that's true, but it, most of the times nowadays, nowadays it's not. Right? Compiler is actually pretty good. So the last piece is the, the, what I was saying about before is that because now we have this decoupling between the logical layer and the physical layer, it's now up to the database management system itself to figure out what the most efficient way to, to actually store your, your, your data right, for each table or each relation. So no longer did I have to say store this table as a tree, store this table as a hash table. I would just say, here's my table. Here's the attributes that it has. 
And it was up for the database management system to figure out, based on the queries you want to run on it, what was the most efficient way to actually store this. Right? And we'll see this later on. There's nothing that says that it actually has to be static. Right? It could decide a tree structure is the right thing now, but based on what, how your application is actually using it, it could switch over to a hash table or some other data structure. And that's fine because at the first point, because we're writing, or the second point, because we're writing our queries in a high level language that doesn't have any information about how, what the underlying data structure is, the data system is, is free to change this uh, any way that it wants. And you as the programmer don't, don't care. So the other key thing that sort of Ted Codd also pr uh, produced is this notion of a data model, right? The data model is essentially a, is a high level concept that is a way to describe the collection of the data that you would actually store in a database. So the relational model is one example. On the next slide, we'll see a bunch of other ones, right? He sort of was the first person that said, all right, here's what this actually means. Uh, you're not just making, you know, you're not just dumping data into a database. You actually can represent it as data model at, at a more high level uh, abstraction. And then a schema is, will be an actual description of a collection of data for its given data model. So again, if you're familiar with SQL, right, SQL you call create table to define a table, right? That's the schema to represent a piece of data or a collection of data within a relational model database. So as I said, there's a bunch of different data models that are out there. These are probably the main ones that are out there now. There's even more obscure ones. Theoreticians went buck wild on this in the 1980s, and there's a bunch of different things uh, that there are some systems out there to actually implement it. Most of the time, you don't need to know, don't need to care. Um, so again, most database systems that, that you can think about are using uh, the relational data model. So the three we had listed at the beginning, SQLite, Redshift, and MongoDB. SQLite and Redshift are relational databases. MongoDB is considered a document database root. Right, or an object database. Um, there's another class of systems you might be familiar with called NoSQL. Um, they sort of fall into these data models here. Key value, graph, document, column family. Again, Mongo is a document database. Graph database would be something like Neo4j. Um, key value would be like Redis, uh, DynamoDB. And column family would be um, uh, like HBase or uh, uh, Bigtable from Google. A lot of things, a lot of, so people say these systems are called NoSQL. A lot of them are actually now adding back SQL support, right? So you can, there's, you can run SQL on top of these different data models. You also have array and matrix data models, right? So instead of serving things as relations, you sort of things as multidimensional arrays. Um, there are a small number of systems that actually do this. SciDB is, is probably the most famous one. And then the last two are these hierarchical and network data model. Uh, so IMS is hierarchical. The network data model was this other thing uh, called uh, IDM, what's a codicil model. These are obsolete and rare. Uh, if you hate yourself and you want to get a job in the industry to do maintenance on old code from the 1960s, right, you will come across these style of databases. But if you're a new startup, there's no way in hell you would actually use these. Okay? So for this class, we're going to focus mostly on the relational data model. And part of the reason is that with the exception for the array of matrices, you can represent all of these things, all these other data models in the relational model, right? A key value data model is just a relation with, you know, two columns, right? Graph databases, you can represent the, the relationships as, again, just as, as another relation. Um, it's my opinion that uh, most of the times people, what people need is a relational data model. Uh, there are obviously some cases where one of these more specialized systems might actually be better. But it's more about the API that are exposed to you as the programmer uh, and not so much how the data is actually stored, right? So in the graph databases, for example, they have specialized uh, you know, function calls and, and ways to run queries that, that assume you're running on a graph model and therefore they can work more efficiently than writing SQL. But again, at the storage level, they're, they're essentially the same. Okay. So the relational data model is going to define three things. So the first is the structure, right? And this is essentially a definition of, for each relation, here's the attributes that they have, and here's the domain of the values that you can actually store in them. So in my example earlier, when I showed the, the artist relation or the artist table, right? An artist had a name, a country, and a year, right? The name has to be like a string uh, type, and the year has to be an integer type, right? That, you define that in, in the structure. 
Then you have the integrity uh, uh, definitions, and this is essentially the, the constraints you can impose on the, on the tuples and the values for the attributes that have to be satisfied in order for you to allow to store a tuple in the, uh, or store a tuple in, into that relation. So again, I, my structure I define, I have three fields, name, country, and, and year, and then a integrity constraint could be, I can't store anything unless it's an integer for a year. Right? Otherwise, it's an invalid tuple. And the last one is defining uh, the manipulation constructs, and this is essentially how we're going to actually access and modify the data in, in a relation. So this is what we're going to talk about today when we talk about relational algebra. Right? And, and SQL, this is essentially, you, you define your tables, and then you, you write queries to actually get, the, get to the data. So the relational model is, the, is based on this notion of a relation. Right, so don't think of it as like I'm in a relationship with my wife or your, your whatever, right? It's the actual table itself in the mathematical terms is called a relation. And so a relation is going to be an unordered set that contain the relationship of attributes that represent different entities in, in that table, in that relation. Right, so the important thing that's going to come up throughout the semester is this notion that the, the relations are unordered. Right? And this is going to actually gonna, this matters from a from a from a systems implementation standpoint because we don't have to maintain ordering. This allows us to do a lot of things more efficiently than you would have otherwise. Right. So it also means that we're going to end up in cases where a query can produce different results that are actually still all considered correct because things are unordered. Right. If you care about ordering, you define an order by to sort things. Right. If not, then it's it can be any random order that it wants. And then within a relation, we can have a tuple, right? And that's going to be defined by the set of attribute values for a given instance of a uh, relationship within in, in our relation. So under the original description of the relational model from, from Ted Codd from the 1970s, the values for these attributes in a tuple have to be scalar or atomic, right? I mean, they, they can't be lists. They can't be sort of nested data structures. In newer systems, that, that's actually relaxed. You can actually do this. But in the original definition, you couldn't. And then we're also going to uh, have a special value called null that works a lot like how nulls work in C or C++. Right? It essentially means that the value for a particular attribute it will be undefined. Right? This, this data system does, simply doesn't know anything about it. So in our example from before, from artist name and year, right, this is defining the relationship for that. Right? It essentially looks the same thing as, as our flat files, except now that I'm, I'm the, the, the database system actually is maintaining the field delimiters themselves. I no longer have to parse commas. To be a bit more mathematical, uh, we can say that a, uh, a relation that has n attributes is called a n-ary relation. Right? N-ary will come up later on when we talk about the, the storage models for these things. Um, but just so that you know, you know the term, uh, it means n -ary. All right, the other key thing about relational models is that it in introduces uh, two types of keys. So primary keys and foreign keys. So a primary key is some set of attributes for that relation that will uniquely identify every single tuple, or, or exactly one tuple. So in this case here, uh, none of these are actually the primary key for us because there's nothing really stopping from someone else from naming their band Ice Cube, right? So we can't assume that the name is going to be unique, right? So what we can do instead is we can introduce a special primary key called the ID, right? And this is just some unique integer to represent exactly our, the one tuple that we want. So what will happen is that if uh, you don't define a primary key, some database systems will actually generate one for you, but they'll maintain it internally. So MySQL, for example, if, if you don't declare a primary key, underneath the covers it uses the row ID, which is like basically the, the, the block ID and offset of where it's actually stored on disk. And I'll use that to represent the primary key for you. Um, if you we'll talk about primary key indexes later on, but if you, if you create one, then there's a bunch of other optimizations you can do to find data more, more quickly for doing you know, selects and updates and things like that. And then instead of having to maintain the, you know, this, this counter for the ID manually in your application, a lot of data, data systems also support for auto, what are called auto-generated keys. So in the SQL standard, it's called sequence. In MySQL, we'll see this over and over again. MySQL likes to do things differently for whatever reason. They call them auto-increment. 
And basically what happened is now if I insert a tuple, there's a counter that always gets added one and creates a new primary key entry for me. The other type of key that we care about are called foreign keys. And this is, a, this is gonna allow us a, a, to model the relationships of relations uh, to make sure that we're always in sync with each other. So foreign key is gonna allow us to say that one attribute for one relation has to have a matching value in another relation. Right, remember I said before the example was how do, I, how do I make sure that if I have all these albums for Ice Cube and Ice Cube changes his name, how do I make sure that they're always in sync with each other, right? Well, foreign keys will solve this problem for us. So this is the example we had before, right? Now we're issuing, issuing the, the primary key with the integer uh, as the IDE field. But in the case of uh, using this example of the mixtape here, Say this, I have multiple artists here. I said before the relational model has to have scalar values, so I can't have a list of values here. I need to have some way to keep track of there's multiple, uh, there's multiple art artists that belong to a single album, right? So I can do this through a, what's called a cross-reference table. And here, the, the standard way to, to, to denote this is this, you concatenate the two uh, names of the relations, the two names of the tables together. So now I have a new relation called artist album, that's going to have an artist ID and an album ID. Um, I no longer need to store the artist in the album table. And then I have foreign keys now in this other relation now pointing to these, bo both of these things here. And the combination of an artist ID and an album ID is the primary key for this relation because you can have multiple attributes together as a primary key. And this assures that one artist can't be uh, on the same album multiple times or denoted that's on the same time, right? So we'll see this later on when we talk about joins, but now I can write queries that will combine these relations together and match up the different attributes based on their foreign keys. And underneath the covers of the data system, most data systems will actually do is that if I try to insert an entry into the artist album relation that doesn't have a matching artist in the artist table and doesn't have a matching album in the album table, it'll throw an error. It'll prevent me from doing that. Right? Because it says I don't have a, you know, there's no corresponding uh, match for the foreign key. Or likewise, if I delete a, an entry from the album table, I can have it automatically d delete the entry from the artist album table. Right? This is called a cascading delete. Right? This ensures that there's no dangling pointer to, to, to something that doesn't exist anymore. Right? This is another good example of what a database management system will provide for you that you would otherwise have to write yourself in, in your application code. All right, so now that we understand roughly what a relational model is and, and, and how we actually can, can store data in them, now we need to actually get, get data out of it, right? Put data in and get data out of it, all right? And there's essentially two sort of classes of languages that you can implement for this. Um, the first are called procedural, where this is where you're going to define at a high level the actual steps you're going to execute to, to run your query. Um, and the second one is called non-procedural, where you describe at a really high level the answer you want the, the data system to actually compute. And then it's left to figure out how to actually do that uh, automatically on its own. So the first one is, is what the category of relation, uh, relational algebra is, which we'll cover in the next couple of slides. The last one is what relational calculus is based on. We are not going to cover this because its usefulness is very limited for what we care about in this course. Uh, if you're building a query optimizer from scratch, this is something that you have to understand. Or let's say you want to replace SQL with something even better, although in my opinion, SQL is pretty good. Uh, then you would you have to understand relational calculus actually how to do this. So we're we're, we're going to focus on uh, relational algebra here. So so relational algebra again is the uh, the fundamental operations we can define to actually retrieve and manipulate data uh, that that actually stored in a relation. And this is, again this was defined by Ted Cobb when he wrote those early papers in the 1970s. Right, he sort of laid out here's what a relational model is, and here's a relational algebra to actually read and write data or get data in and out of, of relations. So there's going to be uh, seven different operators we're going to care about. Uh, we'll go through these at a high level. They'll mostly come up later on when we talk about query execution. Um, they're, not, they're not hard to understand. Just, it's, I think it's important to just at least see them once so that when they come up again, you, you know what they are. So each operator is going to take in uh, either one or more relations as the input, and it's always going to output a new relation. And the idea here is that when we actually want to write queries, we're going to chain together all these operators together using them as sort of the, the, the building blocks to then generate more complex queries that derive more complicated answers than the basic things. 
So the first relational operator is to do a select, right? And that's represented by the, the lowercase sigma, sigma symbol. Right? In my opinion, this is easy to, easy to remember because it's a select starts with an S and the sigma starts with an S. Um, but the, the basic idea is here is that we're going to take uh, our relation as our input and then we're going to select or choose a subset of the tuples that we actually want to produce as our output. Right? In the actual re original relational model papers, these, these are called restrict. Right, because it's essentially restricting what tuples are actually put in the output. All right, it's going to be represented this with the lower, the lower sigma, followed by a, uh, a subscript predicate. I think of like you know something like classic Boolean logic, like if something is greater than something or something less than something, and then we define what relation we want to apply the selection on. So let's say I have a simple relation like this. I have relation R has two attributes A, AID, and BID. So I can have a select like this that says where AID equals A2, and then the output that's produced is just, again, any tuple where the attribute uh, AID equals A2. I can start combining these together, uh, again, using conjunctions and disjunctions to do things like uh, select where AID is equals 2 and BID is greater than 102. And again, that just only selects that one tuple as the output. Right? Pretty straightforward. In SQL, essentially looks what we're defining here is essentially the same thing as, as like the where clause, right? So this what we have in the where clause below is the same thing that we had up above in in uh, for our predicate here, right? Again, it's not exactly the same as the select because the select can do in, in SQL can do much more stuff that we can't do here in the relational algebra. The next thing we have is projection, right? and projection is basically going to limit which attributes actually get produced as the output from the input, right? So again, projection starts with the P. You represent this with a lowercase pi symbol. Um, the thing you can do with the projection is that you can, and more than just saying, take these attributes and produce as my output, you, it can, you actually can reorder them, right? The output of, of, the output of, of these operators are actually, uh, the order actually matters for the attributes in, in a single tuple. The ordering of the tuples across the entire relation actually doesn't matter. You can also actually manipulate them to actually change the output based on some additional logic. So I can do a projection like this where I say uh, I have my in inner select where I say AID equals 2 from the relation R. But then in my projection list, I want to take the BID, subtract it by 100, and then output the AID. So I'm flipping the order and manipulating the BID. Right? And again, now you see how we start to chain these things together to produce more complicated things. And in SQL, it would essentially look like this. Right? The, the output target of the select statement is, is the same thing in, in my uh, output target in the, in the projection operator. Yes? Um, is it fair to say that SQL is intensely procedural? Or I'm slightly confused about that. Okay. Its question is, is it fair to say that SQL is inherently procedural? No. So SQL is actually a non-procedural language based on relational algebra. All right, the difference here is that in SQL, I'm saying, I'm defining what I want, not actually how to actually execute that. Right? In relational algebra, you would start at the, the inside of the, of, the, of the parentheses. So I have to do this select first, and then I can do my projection. Right? So it's sort of like, it's almost like the exact steps you have to execute to actually produce the answer. In SQL, for this simple example, you, you would essentially do it the same way the relational algebra is written. But when we see more complicated things, it, it, you, don't, you don't have to execute it the same way that the relational algebra actually defines it. All right, so now we can talk about the additional uh, binary operators. Again, if you take in discrete math or any kind of set theory course, this sh should all be very familiar. Uh, we can do a union. Right, you basically take two relations, and you're gonna take all the tuples that are in the one, in one relation, all the tuples in the other relation, and combine them together in, in a new relation. So for so for this, I now have R relation R AID BID and S with AID and BID. So when I take the union of them, it's just again concatenating the two uh, relations together. So in this example here, uh, it is ordered based on the two relations. So in the output, I have all the tuples from R followed by all the tuples from S. But again, under the relational model, it's actually unordered. So this can actually be in any possible order that it wants, that, or that you know, whatever the system wants to use. 
And then there's a union operator in SQL that essentially works just like this. So um, for this to work, though, what I'll say is that you have to have the, the, the two relations you're trying to union together, they have to have the exact same attributes with the same, same domains, the same types. Right? If the S relation has a third attribute, then the union wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed to proceed. And it works the same, same way in SQL. There's also intersection, again, same thing, where you just basically get all the tuples that appear in both, both uh, input relations. So in case of R and S, when I take the intersection of them, I, I only get that single tuple. And again, the same thing, I, I can do this, you know, there's an in intersect operator in SQL, and it has to assume that the two relations have the exact same number of attributes. Uh, the last one is difference. And again, you're basically taking uh, all the tuples that appear, appear in the first relation, and removing any ones that appear in, in the second relation. And so, again, it works just like the other ones. I take the difference and I produce the output. And in, uh, in SQL, the keyword is accept to do this. All right, so now we're going to maybe do a more complicated things to start combining these tuples together other than those basic set operators. So the first thing we can do is take the product of two sets. So this is sometimes called the Cartesian product. Basically, you get all of the tuples, you get, you're going to get a new relation as your output that contains all possible combinations of the tuples from the two relations, right? So you take R and S, you take, you take the product of them, uh, the cross join, and then you produce, again, this, this giant map like this. So here now, again, we're not, we're actually concatenating the, the tuples together and producing them as, as a new tuple. So the first two relations, the original relations, each had two columns. In my output now, they have four columns, right? So for every single tuple in the first relation, I'm concatenating together with every single tuple in the second relation, and so forth. So this seems kind of useless, right? Why would you actually, anyone, I mean, why would you actually want to do this? Anyone think of an example where you would actually want to use something like this? What's that? Join, yeah. we'll see join next slide, but no. This is a type of join, but it's actually, you know, it's, it's not trying to match things up. It's just trying to get all possible combinations. So this shows up in testing a lot, right? If you want to make sure that you test every single combination of, of you know, different parameters, you take the Cartesian product, right? It's actually really simple to implement, right? Because it's two for loops. We just, for every single entry in the first one, loop through every single entry in the second one and concatenate, concatenate them together. In SQL, there is a cross-join operator like this. Um, you can also get the same thing if you just have two relations listed in the from clause without a where clause to define how they're actually being joined together. All right, so the thing that they asked about, or the thing that somebody mentioned before, was to do a join. And so a, jo a join is basically like a superset of a cross-join. Um, in this example here, we're doing essentially what I call a straight join or equi join or our natural join, where we're going to take, uh, we're going to create a new relation where we get a combination of the tuples that match some predicate in, you know, in, in a, to do our join uh, in both of our relations. So in this example here, we're going to take the, all, every single attributes in R, and we're going to check to see if there's an, a tuple in S that has the exact same values and the exact same attributes, right? So the output would look like this. So A3 and 103, there's only one tuple in, in R that has a match in S, and that's produced as our output. Right? It's called a natural join because it's the natural way, you know, natural in quotes, you would combine together uh, these two relations. In SQL, you can invoke it directly as, as a natural join like this. So again, it's going to look to see, do I have two attributes with the exact same name in these two relations, and check to see whether their values match up. Yes? So what's the difference between this and the intersection? This question is, what is the difference between this and the intersection? The intersection is removing any attributes. Uh, no, it's, the attributes are the same. Yes, good question. It's a difference. Oh, sorry, one. That contain the tuples that appear in both of the input relations. In this case here, yes, it's the same. Yes. 
So natural join doesn't appear actually that much. You actually don't want to use this because you're assuming that the you're sort of assuming that the schema can match up based on the names. We'll see examples when we talk about joins later in the semester where you can actually define how you want to join in the on clause or the where clause, right? You actually you almost will never see something like this, but this is how you would define it in the original relational algebra. In the back, yes. His question is, if the AID did not match, or the BID value match, would I still produce a joined output? Yeah, would you produce the same output? No, right? Because the natural joint, because for every single attribute that has the same, every single attribute that has the same name, actually, this is, this is the answer to your question. Every, for every single attribute that has the same name, I'll compare to see whether they match. And if at least one of them doesn't match, then it's not produced as the output. So... The difference between a, a, this natural join and the intersection. The intersection, you have to have exactly the same attributes. In the natural join, I could have a third attribute on S, and it wouldn't actually match them, right? Because there's no corresponding one in R. Okay. So these seven operators that I should, just went through, these are the again the basic building blocks of what was defined by Ted Codd in the original relational model papers from the 1970s. But it's obviously there's a bunch of examples we can think of where the, the original relational, these original relational algebras doesn't cover, right? Sorting, how to actually do updates, renaming the, renaming the columns. So after the, the original paper, there was, there was a bunch of extensions for the relational model, relational algebra, that cover all these things we'd actually care about in, in, in the real world, right? So, these are the basic symbols that actually do these things. Again, from our purposes, we don't really care so much because we're actually building a system that, um, that we can then apply these things on top of and go beyond what the original, original relational algebra can actually do. But again, these are just important to sort of understand and know that they actually exist, and we'll see them later on when we talk about query processing. Okay, so the question he had earlier before was, is SQL essentially just a relational algebra? And I said no. Right? Again, the reason is because relational algebra is still going to define the exact steps you want to use to actually execute the query. So what I mean by that, let's say I have two, I have a single query that wants to find all the, uh, the entries uh, from, from the natural join of RNS where BID equals 102. So these two relational algebra statements here are actually equivalent. They will produce the same answer. Right? The first one does the, the natural join between R and S, then it does the projection, or sorry, then it does the restriction of the select to filter out all the entries where, where, that, where BID doesn't equal 102. And in the second one here, I actually do the selection on S first, then I do the natural join. These will produce the exactly the same answer, but these are actually have a lot different runtime performance. Right? If I have, if every single tuple in S has value equals 102, then it's the same thing as, as this one here because it always can produce the same output. But if only one out of, a, out of a billion has value of 102, then the second one's actually faster because I'm going to filter out everything, then actually do the join. So again, this is why I was saying that in, in a procedural language like relational algebra, you're still defining the steps you'd actually need to do to execute the query. Right? And what we really want is just to say at a high level what, what the answer we want, and we'll have the, the data system figure out how to do that for us. So in English, this sentence here, retrieve the join tuples from RNS where BID equals 102, that's, this is equivalent to what these guys are doing, but I didn't say actually how to do it. The data system can figure out, oh, I, I, have, I have one tuple out of a billion that has value equals 102, so let me do my, my, my predicate first, let me do my filtering first, and then I'll do my join. Right? Or if it knows that all the values equals 102, then I'll just do the join anyway because it doesn't, doesn't actually matter. So this is what SQL is going to be for us. Right? It's going to be a way for us to define at a high level, declare at a high level what we want the answer to be, regardless of how the, how the, 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 the data is actually being physically stored or how the... Uh, we want to order our operators in our relational algebra. So we'll see this later in the semester when we talk about query optimization. There's a bunch of rules you can define how you actually can reorder relational algebra uh, operators and be guaranteed they're always going to still produce the same answer. 
So the, the main takeaway from this is that SQL is essentially the, the de facto standard for how you write queries on the on relational model databases. And actually, a lot of the, uh, the other data models that I talked about before, a lot of these NoSQL systems and, and uh, other types of systems, they're now adding SQL support on top of, the, of their, their systems because it's, it's the de facto standard. It's everywhere. This is what people expect uh, if you want to have a sort of a, a database system that people can use or want to use. So essentially what's going to happen is, this is the example that I had before where I looped through my flat file, looked at every single line and tried to find the match where, where the, value, the name equals ice cube. But now I can just declare it in my SQL statement at a high level. This is the answer that I want. And the data system is free to figure out the best way to actually do it. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So we'll finish up here. Please leave your, uh, your self-assessment for the C++ stuff before you leave. Again, so we just, I'll post the answers tonight on Piazza. It's, again, for me, try to figure out how you actually, how well you actually know C++. The main takeaway from all this, again, databases are everywhere. You're going to come across them throughout your life, so they're important. Relational algebras being the primitives we can build on top of to do more complicated things. And then we'll see later on how, actually, how do you uh, take relational algebra and generate optimized queries for that. Okay? All right, so next class, we will, start, we will cover what I call advanced SQL. This is sort of like a high-level overview of SQL. Most of you guys have already seen SQL before, so we're not going to spend time on how to write selects. We'll start with the advanced stuff on, on Wednesday, and you'll need this for homework one. Okay? All right, guys. See you on Wednesday. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. <laughs> what is it? Yes. It's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I could do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup, so yeah, I'm a fool cause I drink proof. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth One, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a 40. A six pack 40 act gets the real pop. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter.